Yeah, I begin the recording. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the sim uh, symmetry seminar. Um, it's a pleasure today to have Christian Copetti, uh, who will tell us about zoology of non invertible duality defects. Okay, take it away. Okay, thanks, Matthew. So, thanks a lot. Uh for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to give this talk. So today I'm going to explore a bit the structure of uh, non-invertible duality defects and uh, their fusion rules. This is really still a work in progress. So uh, some things uh, will be a bit sketchy. Some things will be more explicit. And uh, so let's start. So this is based roughly on two papers. One, which is this one, which appeared uh, some months ago with Andrea Antinucci, Francesco Benini, Giovanni Galatti, and Giovanni Rizzi from CISA. And uh, the thing I will talk most today is uh, this other work, which should appear soon. Okay, so let me just give a bit of the plan for the talk. So I will start by giving an introduction to duality defects uh, by explaining the most, uh, maybe the simplest case, which is n equal for super young Niels. Uh, this is kind of well known by now, but it's a good starting point. Then I will try to discuss what happens when uh, the one form symmetry is uh, bigger than Zn. So it's some Zn to the G. And I will have to introduce some new concept uh, to classify the defects, which will be the rank of a defect. Uh, this part we probably have to skip because I, th I thought I would also talk about uh, the 5D perspective. So uh, how this is, you can see from 5D TQFP, but uh, my <laughs> experimentally seems this is hard to cover. So maybe I will just say something in the end. And then I will conclude uh, by giving some examples that you can find in theories of class S. Okay, so let's start. So first, uh, I mean, let's just, just uh, give a very wide review. So I will uh, use this modern mantra, which uh, since it's around since 2014, that uh, symmetry in quantum field theory should be taught as the set of topological operators, which will be my definition of symmetry. Good. So this leads to various generalizations with respect to the normal notion like uh, the one of uh, higher form symmetries. So for example, you, could, you can consider topological operators which are labeled by a group G, which is abelian when, uh, in, in these cases of interest, and the codimension P plus one surface sigma, P is strictly bigger than zero now. And these guys will have uh, fusion rules, which are the same as the group composition law, which is this equation here. And they will be, represented by unitary operators on the Hilbert space. So you have this other equation. And they act uh, on uh, extended operators of the quantum field theory by linking, which is the third uh, picture. And this is just uh, some uh, one-dimensional representation of the uh, abelian group. So this is the simplest example, which I will not talk about much today. More recently, people also started to study uh, symmetry structure, which do not need an underlying group. So in these cases, the fusion algebra is more general, and you can get various simple objects on the right-hand side. And these are weighted by some coefficient here, uh, which uh, in 2D, this is just for lines in 2D, this is a positive integer number. But in general, apparently, this is still not completely understood. So in general, this is the partition function of some TQFT, which we'll see some examples of today. And then there is much more structure. This is just the structure of the fusion. But from this, you can already infer that these cannot be implemented by unitary operators on the Hilbert space. So there is some statement, I think, in two dimensions that can, can, they can be unitarized if you add the twisted sectors for uh, 
the symmetry, but I don't know if it's true in higher dimensions or not. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but into this, in, into D, these have, start, have been studied for a long time, and uh, most notably into the rational CFTs since the work of Ferlinde, Petkova, and Zuber, and so on. There is a lot of literature about this, but today we will talk about uh, higher dimensions. Okay, and by the way, I didn't say it, but if you have questions, I mean, you can stop me at any time. I'm happy to, to answer. Okay. So this field of studying these more general symmetries in the last couple of years have seen a very fast development. So I, I started to write this slide with all the references, and I realized that most of the references I, I had in mind were from 2022. So this is a good sign, I guess. A lot of things have been done in higher dimensions, mostly uh, full dimensional quantum field theories. 3D, there is some work, but uh, not, not a lot, I have to say. If, like there is a lot of work in 3D MTCs, for example, but not on uh, theories which have both uh, a CFT and uh, some uh, topological degrees of freedom. There has been a lot of discussion of this symmetry TFT techniques, which allow to extract a lot of information about the generalized symmetries from uh, higher dimensional TQFT. And recently, also a lot of applications in holography and uh, string theory. And also, on the other side, there is a much more mathematical, mathematically oriented uh, part, and which studies the representation theory and the structure of these uh, of, of these objects. So there is a lot of maths paper that I didn't cite because I don't know them well, but there is some number of physics physics-oriented paper now, too, which I think are very interesting. But OK, this is uh, just uh, what happened a bit. But let's go to today's talk. So today, today's focus is only on four dimensions. And if you do the symmetry theories, the 5D five, five theory, and we will study self-duality defects. So these have been introduced last year and by, by these authors. And the idea is that you have a, a 4D theory, which is uh, equivalent to itself under gauging. So the equivalence is usually a duality. So often you need some supersymmetric uh, theory or some free theory to have this kind of stuff in higher dimensions. But when you have this kind of equivalence, you can construct uh, a topological defect in the following way. You start from your theory T. Then you gauge the symmetry G, which in my case will be always a one form symmetry. So it's a subgroup of the one form symmetry of the theory. I gauge G in our space. And then I realize that I can compose, compose it to a duality interface, which is this, to map back to the original theory. So the duality interface, if you want, doesn't really do anything, just uh, calls the things in different names because the dual theories are the same theory. But it's a very useful bookkeeping device and is useful to, fire, to extract some information about the defect. So after you have this, you can just uh, shrink this, uh, this interval and you end up with some uh, co-dimension one defect, which I will call curly D, which is my self-duality defect. So this is non-invertible in general. And if you compute the fusion which, with this orientation reversal, you will get a condensate. A condensate, in this case, is just uh, the gauging of the one form symmetry in a on a condimension one manifold. And the way to see that this happens is quite easy. You, you, you think of composing the two defects. So you have uh, these, oh, these two guys. I will label the various interfaces. So I will have uh, S here, S to the minus one here, and then here I have phi, which is the gauging interface for me, phi of Zn, for example. But then I can compose these two. Since they are inverses, they, they will uh, disappear. They'll get just a big slab, which inside as the gauge theory and outside the normal theory. But then when, once you collapse this lab, 
you remain with the gauging which is uh, constrained to live uh, on the on the boundary uh, which is the condensation defect of course this depends on the boundary conditions that you put on this side but if you choose the right ones this is what happens and you find this uh, more general fusion algebra uh, which is not uh, a simple group law um you can study also more general fusions and this is what we will do today but for now this is like the universal property of these kinds of kinds of defects okay so let me just give the basic example which is n equal four super young mills with gauge group sun so the one form symmetry here g1 is just zn and is implemented by surface operators which are this ul which uh, act on Wilson lines by linking. And the charge is just the nullity of the Wilson line. So the number of boxes in the representation. And the way to construct the symmetry is that you start from SUN with some gauge coupling tau. You gauge. If you gauge, you go to PSUN. This is uh, the labeling of the dynamical theta angle. So this is zero. But then you can do as duality of the theory and go back to an SUN theory, but with different value of tau usually. However, if tau is at the self-dual point, if tau equals i, is the same theory as before. So you have constructed the defect. And this is just a realization. So you, you first uh, gauge, then you co compose with test duality, and you're back to your original place. And so this is the simplest example. You can discuss this in various other uh, kind of uh, N equal four theories with different gauge groups, and this has been done uh, in this paper uh, here. Let's see if I can. Talk. Okay. So before going on, I think it's useful to set some notation. So we will need uh, to distinguish uh, theories which have the same spectrum of local operators, but have different spectrum of line operators. Uh, the way in which you do it uh, has been outlined uh, in this very famous paper of Aroni, Seiberg, and Tachikawa. And the idea is that you start, uh, you have to find some uh, Lagrangian algebra inside uh, this uh, big lattice, which is the product of the center of the universal cover of the gauge group, and uh, the same thing but for, but for the Langlands dual. So in the case of SUN, this is Zn times Zn in our case before and uh, you have uh, the way in which you define the, the lattice is using the Dirac pairing and the Lagrangian algebra is just a half dimensional uh, lattice which is uh, which has no pairing between its elements so for example uh, if if I do uh, well this I should this should be the algebra so uh, SU2 I have z2 times z2 lattice and the, the pairing uh, between two vectors. Yes, sorry, yes, let's try to do it. As the electric and man magnetic charges. So, uh, mod two. And there are only two Lagrangian lattices, which are generate three Lagrangian lattices, sorry, which are generated by these three vectors. It's the usual thing that you have three variants in uh, SU two. So you can you should think of this in this way. So the Lagrangian lattice, which uh, as as labels uh, charges under the center, the the one form symmetry, it labels the local line operators modulo the ones which are, are not charged under the one form symmetry so those uh, you don't see in this construction they are always good and the one form symmetry instead uh, is labeled by a quotient of the full one form symmetry gamma by the Lagrangian lattice so I call this uh, S by symmetry and the point is that uh, uh, since this the, since the guys in this quotient need to have pairing with at least one vector in the Lagrangian lattice, they act faithfully on the on the on the 
on the set of lines uh, which which have some uh, symmetry this is how you but you can also think of these as labeling twisted line operators so you you can have uh, line operators which are at the end of the one form symmetry surfaces since the since the the symmetry acts on the lines in l it means that uh, the the operator at the end of the the surface and the lap and the line are not mutually local so they are not good line operators in the theories so they're like uh, ill quantized line operators but they're they're still there and it's it's useful to keep in mind this labeling because in some uh, examples it will be important so in the end so we have essentially we have to play with one lattice l which is uh, something that is given and we will also have to play with the, the choice of symmetry, which will be this quotient. Okay, everything is clear. Okay, very well. So as I said, you can use this to label the... the, the so it, it's useful to use this as a label for the theory, apart from the gauge coupling. So we will uh, usually just uh, use this notation TL, uh, to refer to a theory with a certain choice of line operators. For example, for SUN, this is for N prime. There are N plus one choices, which are these kind of lattices. And the, the, the group of duality acts in a very simple way on these lattices because it acts in the fundamental representation. So you can just start with the matrix and see where you go. So it's very simple to keep track of this. Okay, so this, this intermission is over. And so now we'll let, let us talk about something uh, a bit more uh, specific. So it's how this defect act on line operators then. So the, this duality defect do not act in a special way on local operators because the one from symmetry gauging does not, does not see local operators. So that, that action is just the action of S-duality, whatever transformation you have. But they do act on line operators and they act as follows. So first is this, which is a normal action you would uh, assign to a defect. So this is just a Wilson line, which has a small cylinder of the of the D, D defect around. I, I use radial quantization. This I, I like more as a presentation. Then you can shrink D and see what happens. Since you're gauging the one from symmetry, if the Wilson line is charged and the one from symmetry will project, it will, it will be projected out. So you will, will get a delta function. Uh, maybe there is some uh, overall coefficient here, which I, I, I wasn't careful about. But uh, if, it's, if, it's an, if it's uncharged, so it's, uh, it's some, uh, it has a power of big N uh, boxes in the tableau, if it was a CUN, it will just uh, go through and nothing will happen. So this is like projector, if you want. But something more interesting happens if you consider some, uh, some weird construction, which is attaching a, a, a surface for the one form symmetry to the defect. So this is just uh, how it looks if you go close. So it means that these defects are not really, uh, have some kind of uh, uh, line operators which live on them. But they only come out when you when you intersect them with one form symmetry surfaces. So they are kind of in this space of homomorphism. I, I've been a bit sketchy here because you have to introduce a notation to do it right. But uh, the, the the interesting point is that since if these guys exist, when you shrink the defect, you don't obtain a local operator, but you obtain a line in the twisted sector. And this is exactly what happens in this case. And the simple way to remember this is that the, the twisted sector of operator that you get is just the action of the duality on the, the guy here. So for example, if you had a Wilson line in SUN, you would act with S, you would get a toothed line, but a toothed line with, is not a local line in SUN. So it, it must only exist as a twisted sector. And that's how you can uh, follow all this uh, action. And here too, there is uh, some overall coefficient I wasn't careful about. Okay. So you can develop a similar theory 
for a more general one con symmetry group. So here we will uh, just take Zn to the G, which will be important because will be what uh, will appear in class S in our, in our studies. And uh, we, we need to classify the possible ways to gauge, essentially. Um, so it, it turns out that you can define a set of topological manipulations, which I call phi m here, which is isomorphic to some central extension, if you want, of sp to gzn. If in the case of, uh, of uh, genus equal one, it was just sl2 zn, which is the kind of manipulation that you can do by gauging a one form symmetry zn. And this exists because in four dimension, when you have a one form symmetry, if you gauge, you will get back another one form symmetry. So it's uh, it's something that is closed under composition. Otherwise, it would not be the same. And it's so I will just give you an overcomplete set of generators, which are very easy to remember. And from this, you can construct all the elements. So you can do essentially three things. The first is the sigma operation, which is a gauging of a subgroup uh, A inside of the Zn to the G. So I'm just uh, doing some here also some prefactor I wasn't care, careful about. So just sum over gauge fields, which is this part. Uh, you couple your partition function to the gauge field, and uh, you also do the minimal coupling. So the subscript A is just just means that uh, is the restriction of the full background to A. And uh, so it's a quite simple operation. It's a bit like a Fourier transformation, but it's not the only one. You can do other two things. One is this tau transformation, which is adding uh, a, a discrete torsion as a counter term. So here uh, you see the partition function just multiplied by a phase. And just to set the notation, uh, Ps of B. So if uh, Bi is the gauge field for, to, for the ith, uh, Zn is just uh, this thing. Uh, S I I P of B I plus two sum over okay and P is just the point in square okay so this is essentially B cup B but in a more uh, sophisticated fashion and you have also a third manipulation that you can do which is this new and new is just renaming what is the background field. So you can just uh, multiply your B by some invertible matrix. And it's just uh, choosing another background field. So these two operations uh, do not really change the theory. It's just a choice of counter terms. But when acted upon by this operation, it does something trivial. It's a question. So, so A is a subgroup here. But so yeah. N is prime. That just means a choice of some number of the copies yeah exactly exactly yeah this this will be just uh, some uh, zn uh, zn to the jth power okay in this case yes uh, thanks so these two manipulations that i introduced which were the ones that didn't act on the well just counter terms for my subgroup of sp to g zn which is the parabolic, parabolic subgroup. So you can think of this as some matrix inside the SP and is this kind of matrix here. So from this, you can see essentially that uh, if we want to act with these uh, manipulations, uh, in the end, we have some uh, modding to do because this parabolic subgroup, if you do it at the end of all the manipulations, will be just a choice of counter term. And this will come out uh, afterwards. So just remember that there is this parabolic subgroup uh, lying around, which is just uh, putting a, disc a discrete theta angle as a counter term as choosi and choosing uh, what is the background that you put. So the, a choice of basis in the in the ZN to the G. So to compute fusions, it's useful to introduce this concept of standard form. So you have to you have to parameterize these elements in a kind of uniform fashion if you want to do computations. And what it turns out is that you can always always fix some uh, 
triplet. So P is some element of the parabolic subgroup, which is on the left. Tau is some torsion, A is some gauging, such that the discrete transformation is done in this way. And this, this comes because there is this uh, kind of funny formula, which I call K formula, because there is a K lying around here. This I've, I've done only for one ZN. So now I explain how it comes about. You can do it for multiple, it's just a bit more uh, more cumbersome to track it, no? So I, I didn't put it here. But so what happens is that when you gauge it twice as the end with some discrete torsion in the middle, you can uh, go back to a to a single gauging. So here is only one sigma. And but you have to pay the price that you get some uh, counter term on the left, some different torsion on the right, and this yk which will be also important. This YK is a for the two form gauge theory. It's an invertible TQFT, just the sum of all phases uh, with also some prefactor here, which didn't put. But it will be important afterwards. So let me just give you a, like a sketch of how this, this goes, no? So uh, maybe it's useful to see it once. So you have to write down what uh, what this is on a partition function. Um, so you have to gauge twice. So uh, just for one ZN. Uh, Let me just write what happens. So you have a minimal coupling, the coupling between the two guys. Uh, no, this is K. And uh, times uh, the partition function of B. So then what you do is that you would like to se to separate this B and B prime to make the sum independent. So you want to cancel this term here that you don't want. So what you can do is just you shift. You shift B prime to B prime uh, minus uh, K to the minus one uh, uh, times b. So this you can do if uh, k is co-prime with n. This is important. This is the inverse in the n. And then you expand all the stuff here. So what happens is that from here you get uh, you get a term uh, which is uh, essentially minus uh, b prime cap b and other stuff. So you kill this term here. And then you get two, two sums which are the couple. So you get the sum over b prime. Um, And uh, let's see, k over two, p of b prime plus b prime cap b. This is uh, the couple sum, and times uh, the, the uh, gauging here, which has uh, the z of b. But now they don't talk to each other. Uh, and if you follow this, is uh, this part of the formula. And then if you do this once again to separate big B from B prime in this formula here, you, you get uh, you get also this part, all this uh, all the rest of the stuff here. So it's just uh, some change of variables, but this is kind of the core of this manipulation. So if you know how to do this trick, you can uh, derive this identity. Then you can just apply these algebraic identities. You don't need to worry about the the stuff anymore. So it's kind of neat. So this, so this yk, I can still think of an, as an element of this group, sp. It's just a sum of, uh, mm. or, or how should I think about it as a, an element? No, the, so this is just some decoupled uh, TQFT. So a way to think about it is that the group is really a central extension, if you want, because this is a phase, no, the partition oh, okay. function. I see. So, but... It, 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 it will become important when you consider gauging on, on half space. But otherwise, it's, uh, it, it, it's a bit, if, if you compute some uh, defining relations of the group, it will come out as a central extension. I see. So you have to add some generators and then yeah, yeah. And, uh, and do this. Okay. Yeah, if you want, this is uh, more or less the, the idea. So after having introduced these defects, you can just say what, what is the general construction for the duality defect. So you start with a theory T, which has some uh, duality, which fixes uh, the couplings of T. So like the tau equals ID4, 
this is important. Once we have this, just start with your theory with some uh, global structure L. You compose with a discrete transformation, which is one of these, which uh, maps you to a different global structure. So you see these are gauges inside, so it, they will act on global structure. And the, the labeling I choose is that M is, is uh, where uh, is the matrix that acts on the space of global structures. So uh, that's usually useful to do this. So you go to T to M minus one L, this is my choice of labeling for the defect. And then with M you can go back. And this is just a generalized uh, non-invertible symmetry defect. It's not duality, it depends on the, on the subgroup uh, which fixes the coupling, but you can always construct them in this way. So to understand them, you just understand how the phi compose with each other. Um, so if you build phi by gauging some subgroup A, as we did before, it's clear that not all the one-form symmetry surfaces can terminate uh, on this defect, the M, but only those that, that are inside of A. So that, then what you see is that the number of lines, these kind of non-local lines that were on the defect, uh, is equal to the number of, uh, is equal to the rank of A. And we will call this the, the rank of the defect. So you can think of this defect as something that absorbs uh, surfaces of the one-form symmetries, but in doing so, it has some kind of MTC on it. And the number of, uh, of uh, lines, they are all kind of uh, invertible lines. The number is uh, just the rank. For the duality defect, it was uh, rank, rank N, it had N generators. Uh, so now we can also say what is a general fusion for these guys, and then we will exp explain how to derive it. So the general fusion is as follows. You start with two defects, dm1, dm2. They have rank R1 and R2. So my, my convention is as follows. We have gn to the z, one from symmetry, and the rank is just uh, how many zns there are inside of A. Since uh, n is prime, it's the only possibility, so it's simpler to have like this. This rank is conserved. These this, uh, lines do not go anywhere. So the right hand side has the same number, but they do different things. Some go into the defects that come up, comes out, which is uh, this DM two M one. So they, they compose as a group because they were uh, uh, labeled by the elements of the duality group. Then you have some condensation. You can get some condensation. We'll see how it comes about later which has also some rank. And what is left are lines that uh, do, not, uh, do not couple anymore to anything. And this will be this uh, TQFT coefficients uh, which uh, appear in some cases. So this will be the uh, Z TQFT that I alluded to in the introduction, TQFT. And the way to see how this appear is that you, you, you can think of uh, having uh, the two duality defects, one here and one here. Sorry, quick question. Yeah. Was there, why was there two on the uh, on the bottom there? Minus two R condensation. Ah, yes, because the condensation is like a a, a ZN gauge theory. So when you have uh, you always have the you always have the say electric and magnetic parts. So for example, if you do normal duality. The condensation uh, is a ZN gauge theory, which has uh, N squared lines. So that's the two. Uh, just a matter of labeling, if you want. Okay. So the numbers don't need to add, or no, the the full numbers add, but the way in which they add is kind of funny. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, yeah. So the way to think about this N one two, if you want, is just to start from the two defects. And realize that there are some uh, line operators here and here which can connect through a surface like this. When we put the defects together, the surface disappears, so they become uh, local lines. And the way you see it, when uh, these do not, uh, these cannot see anything uh, in the in the bulk, so they they just are decoupled. 
but the way in which you see it is that you find some partition function of the MTC. So you can have this perspective. Instead of thinking about uh, the defect, you think about the lines that live there and compute how these uh, decompose between each other. So I, I like this perspective, but there are many other perspectives which are equally good. So, so let us come to how you do the computation. So you start with your uh, two defects now. So this is the the one which was d of m1 and this was d of m2. I just copied the definition. But now you take the duality interface and you bring it all the way down here. So duality, you, you can move it. It's not a problem. It just gives you a different description of the same stuff. But what it does, it, it acts on the on the on the variant so on the set of lines because when you go to dual description you use a different set of lines and if you if you track this through you get a different topological manipulation here so you see i i had to i, I start from a different boundary which is the one here and they have to conjugate uh, the matrix and then i get to this other part which is just uh, the composition of the dualities but now what I did in this way is that I separated the part uh, with, which had the duality from the part which has a topological manipulations. And I can just compute the composition of these two. This is the strategy. So then what you do, you parameterize these in the standard form. So you write it in this way. You compose them together and you use this kind of formulas to reduce the number of gaugings until you are again in the standard form. That's the way to do it. If you don't use the standard form, it's, it's a bit tricky because uh, uh, you will get uh, some more decoupled uh, Ys, uh, which I don't know very well what to do. So I, I just fix this kind of uh, framework to work, and uh, then everything is consistent. And then you can interpret the things. So there are three things in this formula. So the first is this. Uh, why that if you remember why was just uh, uh, the coupled uh, to form gauge theory that was fine before it was just a phase but now why lives on half space so you have to think of this as having y here uh we label tilde okay here is y but it has to terminate at some point so this guy then behaves like an anomaly inflow theory for some MTC. And there is a minimal choice for the guy, for the theory which has this anomaly, which is a minimal TQFT A and K. And this is just defined uh, as having uh, um, a set of lines, which under fusion form Zian to the Altwiddle, my convention, and they have spin which is uh, to n, um, let's see, l transposed k. L. OK, so this is just, this essentially defines the MTC, so you can be happy. So this is how you find the, the TQFT coefficient. You find this, the couple TQFT, and you compute the anomaly t, the anomaly in flow, and you get this. So the what I call n to one is just the partition function of this theory. Okay, this you can read off from the structure. Then you get a bunch of terms by the reduction, which will be just the group composition law for these. Uh, discrete gauging defects so they will just give you the definition of the new defect the one which comes out from the group so that's trivial but there is a, a subtlety which is why you get condensations which i think is best i can just do an example so suppose that you want to compute uh, you have one zn you want to compute uh, sigma times sigma and uh, some tau tau of k Okay, so on if you do this on the full space, sigma squared is just a child's conjugation if you want, or one. 
So it is just a, a, a trivial defect. But if you do it on R space, this looks a bit weird. So you have some, uh, this will be some. Uh, um, well, OK. If B. Uh, but now on all space, so if you were uh, if you were uh, on full space, you can just sum with the prime and becomes a delta function. That's why sigma squared was charge conjugation. But if you're on all space, this still gives you some ZN gauge theory on the boundary. And if you're careful about how you put the boundary conditions for these guys, uh, it will be a, a gauge theory for the for the one-form symmetry of the of your theory. So it will be a, a Zn gauge theory coupled to the one-form symmetry, which is definition of the condensation defect. So the way in which you will see condensation, this formalism, is that at some point, when you do this double gauging, you have some intersection between the two things that you gauge, and you have no torsion there. So you have some term which is linear, like. Uh, like this one, then the number of things you gauge goes down, but uh, you don't lose anything because you get a condensation defect. That's uh, the way to see it. And with all this kind of machinery, you can uh, you can just uh, compute uh, the fusions with a lot of patience, but uh, everything is computable essentially. Okay. So are there any questions about this, uh, this formulation? OK, good. So I was planning to talk about uh, 5D2, but I think uh, it's impossible. So I will just go to class S and explain some examples, uh, which uh, you can check some of these also from the bulk perspective, so it's nice. But yeah, I, I I thought it would it was be it was a bit too much. So let's, let's just skip the bulk part. This is just uh, same things, and let's just go to an example. This is a series of classes. So this has been studied by now a bit. So there was a paper this summer about uh, uh, some other type of symmetry that you can get, and a paper two weeks ago about this non-invertible dualities in classes. So I, I I really recommend this paper because they have a very nice discussion of some of the aspects. And so we will just do the simplest kind for us because uh, this is just uh, some uh, proof of concept if you want. So we'll take uh, a m minus a m minus one type theories six d two comma zero, and we reduce them on. Uh, Sigma G without punctures. So this will be the simplest thing. Then you get uh, a, an SCFT, which has uh, n equal to two supersymmetry, and there's a central symmetry, which is uh, Zn to the G, which is why I wanted to study before the Zn to the G case for the one from symmetry. Uh, here I said something about the hol holographic description, but okay, this. Uh, it's a bit out of place since uh, I didn't discuss the, the part before, but we not need it here. So this is the way, anyhow, you have this Zn to the G1 from symmetry, which just comes from uh, uh, from the sigma G by choosing some uh, maximal uh, set of uh, cycles which have uh, which have uh, vanishing pairings. So for example, you can choose a cycles here and here. So it has a very nice geometrical interpretation. And these theories also have a very big duality group, which is just the mapping class group of the sigma G. So it's a set of large different morphism. But not, of, not, not all of this complicated group acts uh, on the one form symmetry. So the one form symmetry, if you want, uh, is encoded in the first uh, homology group. And I mean, you have to reduce it like this. But uh, 
Uh, not, there is a, a kernel for, for that action, which is the Torelli subgroup of the mapping class group. So you have some, some sort of short uh, exact sequence. And uh, so you can just study uh, the group which acts faithfully, which is just a symplectic group, which is what we discussed before. You know? So it's uh, much more simpler. And, and then you have to discuss when these Riemann surfaces uh, are, some, are, are fixed under duality. You know? So being fixed means that you have some discrete isometry. And uh, this is a kind of a complicated problem in mathematics. It's not, it's not solved uh, in full generality, but there are al al algorithms to classify these things up to high enough genus. So uh, like there is a book uh, by this uh, fellow which goes until genus 48, for example. So you, you can find what are these automorphism groups. But once you have a Riemann sort of with an automorphism, you have some self-duality point. So you can use that. And uh, OK, so we also need to specify the global structures. But that, that's kind of simple. So um, you can think in this way. You can think of uh, the group SP when n is prime as acting on all the global structures, but they're all equivalent. So they it will just make a big orbit uh, and going on to every 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 structure a certain number of time which will be the same then you ask what is the stabilizer and uh, the stabilizer is just uh, um well to see the stabilizer you just you can just fi fix one global structure which is uh for example, taking uh, as the generators of the Lagrangian algebra one zero, and this is fixed by the parabolic subgroup of uh, of sp two gzn. So you take the quotient, and this labels all the boundaries, which uh, was also in this paper here. Although they have a slightly different labeling because they consider also counter terms, and then you get a different quotient. But okay. And then you can do a game. So you count how many boundaries you have. So you just count the degree of the quotient. But then you expand the formula. And you see, so you get this kind of funny formula. This uh, Q binomial coefficient is just the number of uh, uh, Zn to the J subgroups of uh, Zn to the G. And this other factor here is the number of uh, symmetric uh, J by J matrices, which we have already seen before these guys. So these were the curly A when we did the discrete gaugings. And this was the matrix S, which was the, the torsion. So it corresponds to this kind of uh, uh, tau kind of composition. And you see there is the right number of uh, global structure, the number of this kind of composition. So this quotient can act well on boundaries. And the rest is just uh, the parabolic subgroup, which acts here by counter terms. So that's uh, one way. And you can also embed this in a matrix of SP by taking the first two columns. And then you have to do some uh, game with the quotienting. So let, let's just do a, the simplest examples is, is when A is the full uh, Zn to the G. Then this corresponds to a matrix in which you can put C below to one and here to a, a symmetric uh, J by J matrix. That's the labeling of, uh, if you want, uh, of this kind of boundaries. And if you gauge less, uh, you have to do some block the composition of these two columns, but it's similar in spirit. So the S will come out at some point. And you have essentially the, the matrix C, when you, you use this uh, quotienting, can be thought of a matrix whose columns are the generators of the subgroup. If the subgroup is not the full uh, Zn to the G, is not a matrix of full rank, it will have some zeros, zero columns, and then the generators. And doing this, you don't overcount boundaries. You just count them once if you're careful. So it's it's useful. OK, so just give one example of a Riemann surface with, which has an automorphism group, which I like, which is the one which has the dihedral group. 
So because you can write this kind of hyperelliptic curve, so it's easy to see the automorphism. So this is just for genus equal to, but you can do it for uh, any genus. There is always this, the group will be bigger, but uh, um, it, it will be the same kind of curve. And you see this as one complex moduli, which is this, which tells you how big the how big these uh, cuts are essentially. And uh, the automorphism, you have some rotation, which is uh, just rotating uh, this kind of triangle. And then you have a reflection, which uh, exchanges uh, x to one over x and y over y, y over x cube, which uh, this guy, it lives fixed and it exchanges this guy here. So this guy goes here and this guy goes here. And if you're careful, uh, you have to also look at the orientations and you can find uh, all the action on the generators of H1. And then it's funny because if you go to lambda equals i, which is a special point, the group becomes bigger. It becomes some um, semi-direct product, which is here. And if you look at the branch covering, it's clear because it becomes an hexagon. So now you can just uh, rotate by this amount instead, and you have a new generator. And the rest acts in the same way. So this kind of a funny group, and this is present in all genus. So okay, it's kind of uh, universal in this way. And another nice thing to notice is that the only transformation which uh, works like as duality, so that exchange the A and B cycles is really this this last sigma. So the one which comes on the special point, and the others are like a bit like T duality, if you want. They do don't bring you some strong to weak coupling. Okay, so you can find the matrices for this, uh, this reasoning. And so let's consider some simple boundaries, which are the ones I introduced before, in which you gauge everything. So it's just one and some symmetric matrix. So by far the, the ones in which you can do the computations in a fast way. So for n equal three, there are 10 such things, including this one, which is the electric boundary. And you can write down uh, the, the transformation law for these guys, it's easy. Um, so if you start from some L label by S, which is the symmetric matrix, you act with M and you go to L of S prime, which is also inside the set. So it's like, <laughs> you have to choose a bit. Then you can find the formula, which is closed and it's easy. And then you compose. And the only thing you need to look at is this, uh, this part in the middle which will give you all the TQFT coefficient, the condensates, and so on, depending on the image and the kernel of the, of the matrix. So you just look at this matrix and find the image and the kernel, you can compute everything. So I wanted to give just one example of how this works in practice. So let's, uh, let's take this boundary here for n equal 3. Back. And we, we want to consider the fusion of sigma and R. So sigma was the S duality, if you want, which came out only on the equal psi. And R is the, is the reflection. It was uh, uh, this transformation here, which is non abelian. So that's why I wanted to consider it. So you just compute uh, how these various matrices maps you from the different boundaries, and then you can compute the matrix size and S prime and uh, you compute the fusions. So you find the following. So L is, uh, again, this, this boundary here this time. You find that uh, sigma times R uh, gives you a condensate times uh, this sigma R defect. So this sigma R, R defect is actually invertible on this boundary. And uh, R times sigma gives you some uh, generalized uh, theory times uh, the other way around, but this is not non-invertible. Okay, so now you can ask, uh, well, is this uh, consistent? No, so you you can try to compute uh, R sigma R, no? so this fusion, which is the same in the two ways. So you can uh, either, uh, let, let's start from here. So here we do for sigma and R, which we said that would give you a condensate times sigma R, which was invertible. This is invertible, so you just put it together and you get here. So you are in this place. But then you have to use the fact that uh, this defect can absorb the lines of the condensate. So you have to look at what is this rank. So you just put them on the defects and you get uh, the 
a partition function of the Zian Gates theory, Zian to Zian squared in this case. So it's just a number. So this is the number you want to get. And while on the other side, you get uh, twice to non trivial fusion between non invertible stuff, but without condensates. So one we already did, and the second is the same, essentially, is uh, very similar. So you get this theory squared, but now you, you realize that the theory uh, AN with this matrix is just the youngest theory. And is equivalent to this one by a change of basis. So this one was actually the same thing, the tuck, and uh, uh, you're done. So it's, uh, it's consistent. And of course, there are many more examples. So the, like uh, the number of groups and boundaries is huge. Uh, for example, uh, genus equal two and with n equals three, which is like one of the simplest, you get 40 kind of global structures. Uh, so you have to kind of choose what you want to compute a bit, but it's doable. And you can also do it from the bulk. So it's nice. And uh, hopefully from this one can learn something uh, interesting about these defects. Uh, so you can find some applications. So are there any questions about this? Uh, I have one question. Yeah. Uh, is this described by fusion category? Uh, what, the, the fusion of the defects or the TQFT? Yeah. Right. Fusion the full thing. Well, it's some kind of gen gen generalized fusion category, yes. But uh, we don't know very well the specifics because we don't know the space of uh, morphisms that uh, mm -hmm. are on these defects very well. So you can construct some of them, which are these lines that are a junction between a one-form symmetry and the non-invertible defects, which is what I'm using here to describe. But we don't know the full structure, which will be nice to know, though. So I think that's something that has to be studied a bit more. Uh, but as far as I know, in uh, 4D, for co-dimension one, at least in the physics literature, there is no case which has been studied uh, completely from this perspective. So in lower dimensions, or when you have a two-dimensional surface, you can, no? because you can because there are some simpler categories, but higher, it's a bit more complicated. But I think some examples should be doable. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, some more consistency conditions like hexagon or pentagon. Or, or yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 there are some conditions like this. But uh, they, they, like, they are not. There is no physics paper which explains mm -hmm. uh, explains them in a way in which you can actually compute them. So usually you can uh, write down this kind of consistency condition in the higher category by knowing some underlying structure, like some group structure, and then you can use mm -hmm. that to classify the possible uh, stuff uh, the possible ways uh, the, the possible constraints but uh, you there is nothing like uh, what you do in MTC is uh, in which you reduce the the constraints like the associativity to a computation of tensors no mm -hmm. which is I don't know uh, I'm more comfortable with but it should be doable I'm working on this. Uh, in some other project, so I think it's doable in some cases. Okay. okay, so I mean, this was the end of the talk, so I can just go to the conclusions of what I think is kind of interesting to study in the future. So this was just kind of an application of uh, some formalism. We kind of developed a bit some things and we did some development in the bulk and this was uh, what we wanted to study. So just to recap, so we've seen some algorithm, if you want, to compute the fusion of these duality defects. Uh, well, this part uh, uh, cancel, we didn't have time, but we see so how to do it in the QFT, and you can do it also in 5D if you want. And the formal is some kind of group, but it's kind of categorical. You will get condensates, you will get some more data, and there will be some interesting structure, I think, if you go down. But it's not clear how to access these higher morphisms yet, to me at least, apart from some special classes. Uh, one interesting thing is that the spectrum of this kind of line operators that you can have on the duality interfaces changes a bit, depends uh, a lot on the type of defects. And 
there is a way to compute it. So it's nice. This should be an important set of data that you add to this uh, duality defects. And OK, there are a lot of examples of this stuff because you have class S theories. So OK, then I want to mention some open questions, which I think are more interesting. So one, one part is to extend when you have punctures. Uh, I think for the regular punctures is not very hard, but there are some subtleties. And uh, you can do some simple cases, and they are very interesting because you can apply them to things. Uh, hopefully, this will come out soon. But uh, uh, OK, so I think it's interesting also to study the question with punctures. Then one other thing that one could wonder if since there is there was this Riemann surface all along, another place in which uh, Riemann surface arises is when you do cyber witten theory instead. So you go on the Coulomb branch, no? So uh, it might be nice to speculate whether there is some applications of these concepts uh, to cyber witten theory. Of course, you, on the Coulomb branch, you will have uh, a huge amount of emergent symmetries if you forget the BTS states, which will come from the symmetry of some generalized Maxwell theories. And there will be some non-invertible symmetries. But what is interesting to ask is whether some, some of these teach you something, for example, about uh, the special points on the Coulomb branch. I think this is an interesting question. It might be no, the answer. So <laughs> I don't know. But uh, I think it's interesting to explore it. Another interesting thing, so now that we are starting to unravel a bit the, the structure of how this thing compose, is the anomaly structure of these uh, defects. So is, is there some, uh, some, some way in which these are anomalous or this cannot be gauged? And can we make this precise? This is a very nice question. And uh, yeah, I, I know only to answer this in, in for two D duality defects, then, then the machinery is ready, but for higher dimension, it's not. So I think it's interesting to study. OK, so that is all. Sorry for taking a bit more time. And if you have questions, I'm here for a while. OK, thanks, Christian. Um, questions? I've already asked quite a few, so if there are others. Um, please just unmute yourself if you like. Uh, all right, well, could you comment on um, uh, whether the defects are, whether the symmetries are intrinsic or not? Perhaps this is part of the symmetry TFT. So, yeah, but, yeah, but this is this is what the paper of Justin was about uh, in part. So, but the idea is simple. So, if you want uh, something is intrinsic, uh, if there is no boundary on which it becomes invertible, so you just have to look at the Lagrangian algebras and uh, ask if a Lagrangian algebra is invariant under the action of the duality. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, this is just a very, <laughs> very rough synthesis, but uh, I think in the paper of Justin, uh, this is very well explained. So uh, in general, it's like some kind of combinatorial question. Is There is no generic answer. And the, the thing of the ra rank is a bit of generalization of this. So uh, when something is uh, non-intrinsic, there is some, uh, some uh, global structure, which is rank zero, so it's invertible. But you can have intermediate steps in which uh, it's uh, it has a, it doesn't host it, it doesn't absorb the full one from symmetry the defect but can absorb a, a bit, and on the other Wilson lines it acts uh, as some kind of uh, automorphism it just ma maps them to other Wilson lines which are local, so it's kind of an interesting thing. But I, I thought it was interesting to point out this, but. There is no clear application of this concept of rank yet, so hopefully in the future. Yeah, well, I guess it relates to the other question about uh, about how to realize these as high effusion categories. Because if if the symmetries are intrinsic, sorry, if the symmetries are not intrinsic, <laughs> then you have a much a much better handle on what the the high effusion categories are going to be. Ah, yeah, because you be, because you mean that you can uh, just do some gauging and then you have some kind of group. 
yeah but e even then like actually writing down uh, the hexagonal the pentagonal identities it's uh it's non-trivial uh, yes but i think you have a much yeah 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 it's, it's easier it's easier so I, I think one example is you can think of the two group no the two group uh, you, you can always do this thing that you 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 gauge some symmetry no and you 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 go from a two group to some theory which has a mixed anomaly no yes and when you have the two group the two group is like a some higher category which have some non-trivial tumorphism which is the Posnikov class so kind of the data of the anomaly when you had the when you had the the invertible thing no I mean here is all invertible but it could be the map of this stuff becomes uh, the um, which was a constraint the anomaly will become some data in the higher category which is then the Posnikov class so there is this kind of mapping which is interesting it's not trivial but uh, I don't know how to do it uh, in, in general it's not obvious well, it be, should be doable I think all right more questions well, can I ask one please yeah uh, I think one natural uh application of your talk is to constrain algebras and so my question is do you know an example of relevant operator which commits with this duality defects yeah, yeah I'm working on this so there are some examples <laughs> uh, you, you can so there are some examples which I think uh, Justin uh, pointed out uh, in some talk which they call Susie but uh, those are too hard but you can find other examples so this is doable um so this is something I, I'm working on hopefully it comes out soon I, I don't know for sure but you can find some interesting algae flows yes uh mm, let's say there is something so since you don't know the, the anomaly structure you don't have so much power as you would like to constrain algae flows but uh, there should be many examples mm -hmm. okay uh last chance otherwise I'll stop the recording and okay let me stop the recording let's thank Christian again thank you